Uh, it reminded me I was uh, another church one night, and uh, after I went home, somebody phoned me and said, did you see John's keys? And I'm going, no. Did you happen to lift John's keys? No. Well, John's lost his keys. And he was up, no, he was the sound man, he was doing, working around where you were. So, about two weeks later, I went into my bag, and guess what was in my bag? John's car keys. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, I think John's car had been sitting at the church for about two weeks by that point. But we've now found this. Now, there's only one problem with these. And you don't think about it at the time. You know, when somebody hands you this, you think, fine. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's different from the last one. What, what, what do I press? So, uh, nothing's coming on. <laughs> so, do I press the red button, Alec? Is it switched on at the same? Ah. No, it's not. Okay, there we go. You see, that's why you, that's why you should talk to folk before you get up. But uh, good to see you. And this evening we're looking at this subject of the greatest commandment. Uh, I don't know whether it's easier speaking about something that's known or whether it's not. But just let, let's pray before we, we, we do that. Lord, we thank you just for the privilege of being here. And as we look at something which so many of us know and have known for years, we just pray you stir our hearts afresh. We've just been singing that, Lord. Turn our hearts throat, to a flame. From a spark to a flame. Turn our love from a spark to a flame. That's what we ask. And may we sense your presence now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you know what? As you get older, you become... Oh, my wife will admit this. You become more difficult. So I'm going to be difficult to start with. And we're going to look, actually, at not the passage that was given to me, but we're going to be given to this, this one. Uh, this is rather than Exodus, we're going to look at Leviticus chapter 6, verses 5 to 10. And the first thing I want to speak about tonight is what God commanded of his Old Testament people. So you'll see the verses there. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as a symbol on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Why? So that you will always remember. That's why. So that you will always remember. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love him with your heart, with your soul, and with your strength. You know, this is the greatest commandment. And it reminds me of the following. Number one. You know, when we have this picture of God as the Old Testament God, most people think he's distant He's aggressive, he's uh, fearsome, he's a God of judgment, he's harsh, he's at a distance. But this verse tells me something very different. It tells me this, that we have a relational God who wants to be loved, who wants to be honoured, who wants to be adored. It tells me also that we have an emotional God. He, you know, he, his heart responds to our heart. His love responds to our love. We have a relational God, we have an emotional God, and we've got a personal God. That's wonderful. And we tend to think, as we think of the Old Testament, of a God at a distance, of a God set apart from the people. But this verse would tell me very much, these verses would tell me to the contrary. He wants to be involved. And you know, we've got a God who simply asked that we reserve a place for him in our lives. Listen to what it says. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them to your children. You shall talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. He's a God who wants us to reserve a place for him in our hearts and in our lives and in our homes and in our families. And I wonder this evening, do we have place for God? Do we have room for God? Do we have love for God? Does God have a real place? Is he something that thrills our soul when we think of him? And do we talk about him? And are we impressing him upon our children and grandchildren? And for some of you, your great-grandchildren. And so the greatest commandment was to love the Lord. And to speak of the Lord. And to share the Lord. And never forget the Lord. But let's move on. So that's what, that's what God said to an, a nation. And then we move on to what, uh, he told an, what Jesus told an individual in Matthew 22. It says there that hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And one of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. It would have to be a lawyer tonight, Campbell, wouldn't it? Teacher, 
Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love up the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So the first reading is what God said to a nation. The second one is Jesus speaking to an individual. And he's saying effectively the same thing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then takes it further by loving your neighbor as yourself. So the greatest commandment reminds me of the following. If I love God, I should love others. If I love God, I should love others. If you claim to be a Christian, you shouldn't be hard-hearted and cold and indifferent to the needs of others. It should touch your heart. It should touch your life. It should challenge you. It should move you. If I claim to love God, I should love others. And if I want to serve God, I'll be serving others. And if I want to give to God, I'll be giving to others. Love for God should be an overflowing thing. It should pass from us to others. It should be seen. It should be evidenced. It should be abundant. It should be known. Love for God should overflow. And the picture there says we love others best when we love God the most. Actually, history is amazing. The history of our nation is amazing. The history of giving, the history of those who cared most for orphans, for workers, for communities, was often driven by people who loved God. People who loved God. People like George Miller who loved God and who cared for others. I wonder about you this evening. If you claim to love God, do you love others? Because that's the second one. It's Jesus speaking to an individual. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then he's on to say, love your neighbor as yourself. And the third reading is what Paul asked of the New Testament church. And he says this in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. Romans 13, 8 to 10, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commands there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. It's the same message, the message to the nation, the message to the individual, the message to the church. It's, It's the same message. Love the Lord and love others. Love the Lord and love others. And with this, I can say amen and sit down. My job's done. I bet some of you are saying, I wish it was. <laughs> yeah. So let's look at these things. Love is, and love is what God desires. That's what the Lord desires tonight. As we sit here in command, I get to sing, hey, I want you to love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, I want you to love me more than anything, more than anyone. And I wonder this evening, how's your love for God? Is it hot? Is it in fire? Or have you drifted? Is it cold and indifferent? Do you love the Lord tonight? Because that's what matters. You know, when we sit on a Sunday morning at communion, that's what he wants to hear, that you love me. I love you, Lord, for all you've done. So love is what God desires Love is what others need. That's, you know, that's what Paul is saying to the church. Love is what others need. You know, the continuing debt to love one another because that's what others need. And love is a fulfillment of the law. That's really, I've really been impressed by that as I've looked at this. You know, if I love people, all the commands, the ten commands, if I love people, I won't kill. If I love people, I won't steal if I love people, I'll honor them. If I love people and love God, I'll honor my father and mother. If I love people and love God, I won't covet. If I love, I won't take the Lord's name in vain. You know, love is a fulfillment of the law because if we're loving, love would drive us to obey the law and to obey the commands and to follow the law and follow the commands and follow God. Love is a fulfillment of the law and love is a continuing requirement. That's what Paul says. He says here, uh, let no debt remain outstanding except a continuing debt to love one another. So I hope tonight you're not love weary. I hope you're not love weary. Because the Lord, the Lord wants us to love Him. And the Lord wants us to love others. 
know what, I'm amazed just looking at this because the greatest command is a very simple command. When you read through the Old Testament and it becomes very complicated, all those Levitical laws, all those feasts, all those offerings, all those sacrifices, all those do's and all those don'ts and all those things, you know, all those complicated procedures. And yet when it comes to it, this is what the Lord says, I want your love. I want you to love me with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. It's not about feasts and sacrifices. It's not about attendance. It's not about giving. It's not about service. It's just about loving. And so to love the Lord your God is a simple command. But it's a unique command. You know, so many other religions in the world, they don't say love, just love. There's do this and do that. Don't do this and don't do that. There's rules and there's regulations. But when it comes to Christianity... It's a unique command, just simply. The thing that matters most is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's a comprehensive command. What do I mean by that? It covers everything. Because if I love the Lord the way I should, my behaviour will be right. If I love the Lord the way I should, my speech will be right. If I love the Lord the way I should, my thinking will be right. If I love the Lord the way I should, my care for others will be right. Everything is impacted and affected by that one thing, love for God. Love for God will keep me from sin. Love for God will drive me to prayer. Love for God will keep me from wrong. Love for God will help me to serve others. That one thing is a driving force. It is also a restraining force. If I have love for God, it's a comprehensive command. It just controls my behavior. And for that reason, it's a powerful command. Love will impact others. Love will touch the hardest heart. Love will challenge the most aggressive soul. It's a powerful command and it's a life-changing command. I'm sure you've known some people and just by looking at them, the love of Jesus flows from their life. You can see it in their face. You can see it in their demeanor. You can hear it when you talk to them. They're filled with the love of Jesus. One person that jumps to my mind is Corey Ted Boom, the love of Christ. It's overflowed from our face, from our life. You can see it. Because to love the Lord your God with all your heart is a life-changing command. But let me, let me read to you the words of Ari Tori, which are quite challenging. I don't know whether you can see them there or whether your eyes are as bad as mine. He says, If loving God with all our heart and soul and might is the greatest commandment, then it follows that not loving him that way is the greatest sin. Is a challenge. If loving God with all our heart and soul and might is the greatest commandment, then it follows that not loving him that way is the greatest sin. I want to leave that challenge with you tonight. How much do you love the Lord? Do you love him more than your family? Do you love him more than your hobbies? Do you love him more than your your home, your car, your possessions? Do you love him more than your work? Do you love him more than everything? Because that's what he wants. Love the Lord your God with all, 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 all. You know, the greatest commandment demands the following. We have to love God with an exclusive love. There's to be no other God before him. It's to be an exclusive love. No one is to take his place. No idol is to sit in his throne. No other thing uh, uh, is to take over from him. We're to love him with an exclusive love. Him and him alone. We're to love him with a persistent love. A love that lasts from the day we come to know him till the day we die. A A love that's to flow from our lives from now till eternity. It's to be a persistent love. A love that continues. A love that goes on. A love that pervades our lives. It's to be a consistent love. Now that's the hard one. I accept it. It's sometimes we love the Lord a lot, don't we? Other times we, our hearts wander and stray. Sometimes we're flowing with, overflowing with love for Jesus. Other times we're not responsive. But he wants a consistent love. Remember the question to Peter? Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes, Lord. Do you love me? Yes. That's what he wants to hear from all our lives. A consistent love. A love that continues to love him every day. He wants an obedient love. Of course, the Bible says this is love to walk in obedience to his commands. 
You can't claim to love the Lord with all your heart and do your own thing. You can't claim to love the Lord and live a life of sin. You can't claim to love the Lord above everything and do what you want rather than what he wants. The greatest command demands, demands we love God with an obedient love. And you know, the great command also demands that God is our first love. We find that later on in Revelation. He speaks about our first love. So we're back to a question I asked you already. Is the Lord your first love? Do you love him above and beyond everyone and everything else? Do you love him first? And of course, there's the verse up there from the Bible, from 1 John chapter 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. Isn't that amazing? He first loved us. Sometimes I'm a horror to live with. Sometimes I'm, there's no... Uh, I find myself a grumpy old man and yet he first loved us. He first loved me. That's tremendous. To know that he loved me, he loved me, he loved me and he gave his son to die for me. But one thing I did notice when I was looking at this is that, you know, of all the commands, they're all given. Don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, don't, you know, don't honour your father and mother, love the Lord your God, no false idols, etc, etc. But the greatest command is the only command that comes with an explanation. And you'll see that up there. It comes with an explanation. Love the Lord your God. Now that might mean different things to different people. But we're given an explanation. How do we do that? Here it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. All your affections. All your emotions. With everything. Love the Lord your God, how? With all your soul. From the very depths of your being you have to love him. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, why? That's with your intellectual capacity, no matter how large or small it is, with your intellectual capacity, love him with it all. Love the Lord your God with all your strength. The only command with an explanation. I love the words from Spurgeon. With all your heart means intensely. Is that how you would describe your love for God? Intense. Spurgeon goes on. With all your soul means sincerely. Is, a, is there a sincerity and a reality in your love for God? And with all your strength means with all our energy, with every faculty, with every possibility of our nature. Is that how you love God? With effort. It pours out your life. It comes from the depths. It comes from your mind. It comes from your soul. It comes from your heart. Is that how you love the Lord? Because we're told to love him like that. We're told to love him with all of God. We're told to love him with gusto, so to speak. We're told to love him with everything. And we move on to the second part of that command. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, that comes with an explanation. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Loving your neighbour is described in James chapter 4, I think it is, as the royal law. It's the law of heaven. It's the law of heaven's courts to love your neighbour. Loving your neighbour is described in Romans where we read from Paul, the fulfilment of the law. Loving your neighbour is described as the second greatest commandment after loving the Lord your God. Loving your neighbour is so important to Jesus. It's so important to Jesus. It's required of us. And I was just thinking about this and saying, how do we do it? How do we love our neighbour? Well, we're told to love our neighbour as ourselves, but before that, just let's think about uh, what, what it means. You know, tonight we've been talking about the commandments, and when we think, think about our neighbour, the commandments would tell us, do not cover, covet your neighbour's house. Your neighbour's wife, your neighbour's manservant, your neighbour's maidservant. Unfortunately, I live in Presswick, we don't have servants. Maybe you have in Kilmarnock, I don't know. You have to, not to covet your neighbour's ox or donkey or anything, that's your neighbour's. So we've got the negative. Don't do that. And unfortunately, they don't give us the positive. But how can we love our neighbour? We can love our neighbour through praying. Praying for your neighbour. And of course, if you know the story of the Good Samaritan, who's my neighbour? It's anything you come across, it's your neighbour. One day I was driving home, not from Kilmarnock, 
in Kowinne. I was driving down the bypass and I passed a lay-by and there was a guy in, a, in the lay-by in a car and he was sort of hanging over the door like this. And something, I passed him, I thought, something's right. So I went down to the next roundabout and then back to the or other roundabout and come back down. And I stopped and said, excuse me, sir, are you okay? He said, there's nothing great. It's just, oh, it's just a bit of indigestion. I'll be fine. Are you sure? Ah, I just, on you go. Thanks for stopping. But as I went in the car, I thought, no, I'm not happy. So I went back and said, look, you know, I don't think you're right. I think I need to help you. Can I take you to the hospital? So I took him up to Crosshouse Hospital and uh, sat in Crosshouse Hospital waiting for him. He did the pleasure of being sick all over the place just in my presence, but there we go. Uh, and I got a phone call later from his wife to say that he'd been taken up to the Southern General. He was having a brain hemorrhage. And every year, for years after that, I got a card that said, thank you for saving my life. Thank you for saving my life. I was just being the good Samaritan. I was just trying to show love. I was just trying to show care. And that's what we need to do to be responsive. So we love our neighbour through praying. We love our neighbour through chatting, getting to know them, getting to know their needs. We love our neighbour by observing what are their issues, what are their problems, where can we be an asset, how can we be a blessing, how can we be a help, how can we be an encouragement. We love our neighbour by caring, caring for them and all their needs. I've got the habit, my kids think it's hilarious, that every Halloween I get into all our neighbours' children with sweets. I do the same at Christmas. They just show that we care, that we love, that they're all we've got an interest in them. We love our neighbours by giving. We've got a couple of neighbours uh, who are old and struggle a bit and so we tend to share Christmas meals with them and that type of thing because we want to show the love of Jesus. Love your neighbour by helping. Are you doing these things? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbour. Love your neighbour as yourself. Are you responsive? Are you sharing? Are you caring? Are you loving? Are you looking out for others? Are you stepping in to help? Do you knock the door and say, how are you doing? Do you pick up the phone and say, how are you today? Do you pop up a note or send a card? There's so much you can do for others. So much you can do to show that you love, that you care. It's just a case of putting your head down and thinking through, what can I do? Love your neighbour. But I want to go off piste at this point, if that's all right. Love your neighbour as yourself. Have you ever thought about that? One of the big issues of today, especially amongst the younger generation, is low self-esteem. They don't feel worth it. They don't feel they deserve anything. They feel useless. And that's why there's so much self-harm and mental health issues. And you know, one of the... Move on to the next slide... I want to speak just for a short time, not about the greatest commandment, about the greatest commission. You know, I think we have, as a society, we have forgotten who we're to love. Love the Lord, love your neighbour. We've forgotten that. We've forgotten how we're to love as yourself. And this is where it starts. We need to love ourselves. Because loving and valuing ourselves is a key, a key element to loving others. Love your neighbour as yourself is a key element to loving others. Let me read a quote to you. Serving like Jesus only makes sense when we know who we are. We aren't random people doing nice things. We're children of God, living for God, and wanting people to experience the tangible love of God. Serving people is easy when we know who we are and what we're about. Our biggest purpose in life is to give our lives away to others like Christ. And in this, we will receive happiness, fulfillment, and meaning in return. Therefore, go and be a blessing. Serving makes sense when we know who we are. Do you realize today that you're loved, that you're treasured, that you're precious, that you're blessed? You're a child of God, a child of the King. He's given you a purpose to live and a hope for the future. That makes a difference to life. How we react to God and how we react to others. And so, you know, I want to take this in a different direction. The greatest discovery, we've talked about the greatest command, the greatest omission, what about the greatest discovery? 
If you turn to Matthew chapter 20, you meet beggars by the road crying out for help. If you go to Mark chapter 1, there's the leper at the city gate looking for help. John chapter 5, there's the guy at the pool who just wants the the end of the water to be healed. John chapter 4, you meet the woman at the well who nobody wants anything to do with. Why am I mentioning them? They were all avoided by others. They're all hated by themselves. But they were loved by Jesus. They were loved by Jesus. And they were precious to Jesus. And I don't know who's listening. I don't know you tonight. But I just want to say this. Because I think it's important. That Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. We're speaking about about loving God. But remember why. Here's the reason. He first loved us. And he gave his son as a sacrifice. You know Christ loved us loved us and gave himself for us and so I want us to be encouraged tonight that no matter how the, how down you are how despairing you are how isolated you are how lonely you are Jesus loves you Jesus loves you and that makes a difference to your day and it makes a difference to your week and it makes a difference to your life to know I am loved and that's why I can love I am loved and that's why I can give I am loved and that's why I can serve And I think the greatest discovery is to know that you're loved by God. And you're loved of God. And you're precious to God. And he cares for you. And he holds you in the grip of the palm of his hand. That he's got a plan for your life and a purpose for your destiny. It's great to be loved. And the Lord says this. As we come to an end, this is the, the last verse I want to share with you. Dear friends, since God so loved us, Be inspired. Since God so loved us, be encouraged. Since God so loved us, be challenged. Since God so loved us, be motivated. Since God so loved us, be moved. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. So it starts with God. He loves us. He loves us with everything he has. And it ends with God. We're called to love him with our heart, with our mind, with our soul, with our strength. And we're called as evidence of that and proof of that to go out and love others. So I want to ask you, not a question you really get to hear from the platform very often, how's your love life? How's your love life? So in the book of Revelation, there's a church that's condemned and slagged off because they'd left their first love. Can I ask you tonight to return to your first love? And just when you go home tonight, tell the Lord, Lord Jesus, I love you. I know thou art mine, my rock and my fortress, my surety divine. Tell the Lord you love him. And show that by this week going to your neighbours and your friends and showing them something of the love of Jesus. That will change Kilmarnock. That will change this church. That will change your life. That will change the world. (coughs) Let the love of Jesus fill me. As the waters fill the sea, self-effacing him, exalting, this is victory. Let's just pray. Lord, we want to thank you today that we're loved. So loved. Precious in your sight. Help us to respond to you with love and devotion and commitment and worship. And oh God, inspire us to go out there and tell the world of the love of Jesus, to share it, to live it, to love it, to spread it. Lord, challenge our hearts tonight with this, the greatest command. And Lord, tonight I pray we would be the greatest of bearers of that command here in Kilmarnock. And we ask this in Jesus' name.